Good afternoon, everybody, and I hope everybody is uh, awake. We're going to just change the tempo. There's a few slides, colored slides, so that should get everybody revived a little. Um, I've got about 25 slides, and I'm just going to go through them very quickly so that we get onto the Q&A. So the title is uh, Ireland's Industrial Policy in This Turbulent World. Um, and I'm breaking it into three uh, parts. And this is the Gauguin painting of 1898. It's very important. Where do we come from? So we'll spend a little bit of time on that, although I think we have a very good idea of where we come from. More importantly, where are we? Uh, what are we? And then where are we going? So one thing that people very often forget about is Ireland's location. Surely, yeah, we were badly treated in the first industrial revolution. No oil, no coal, no metals or whatever. However, our location is between the two biggest trading blocks in the world, the US and the EU. So we have been a major beneficiary of what's called the law of distance and culture. And a lot of work has been done by a man called Pankaj Gamowat on the laws of globalization, where he has found that all else being equal, the factors of distance and culture result in five times more trade between any two countries than when they are not present. Okay? So, since we joined the EU, or EEC as it was, on the 1st of January 1973, we have benefited hugely from this law. If you think of it, I actually think that the last 45 years, from 72 until 2017, has actually been the Goldilocks era, just perfect for the development of the Irish economy. If you look at it in the broad context, it was post-World War II consensus. We're living, and still are, under Pax Americana. Uh, Pax Americana, and because of post-World War generation of never again, created a whole series of rules-based rules organizations. Multilateralism, modernization, globalization. The US industrial policy was to basically build strong uh, corporates in the US, but then export. And we benefited hugely because of this law of dis distance and culture. So as we all know, the US outsourced business functions to Ireland, and Ireland became the launch pad for a lot of US production into the EU markets. I'm joining the EU, and you see little Ireland here. Uh, oops, sorry, I cut it off. The bottom one. Oh, yeah. It's the one in the middle. Ireland here, we're in the EU, and since joining the EU in 1972, we have benefited from a number of major programs. So initially the French, one of the leaders, the big country in the EU with CAP, modernized our farms. Then we had the Germans, who after the fall of the wall, launched and led a major infrastructure development program. We benefited from that. That brought our infrastructure. I'll always remember Albert Reynolds, I think we all remember bringing back 8 billion of European structural funds into Ireland. Since the 2000s, we've also benefited from the lead of another major European country, the UK, in the maintenance of a liberal uh, fiscal and financial services economy. And that has protected Ireland. So really, it has been near perfect. This then uh, led, as I said, to, again, the law of distance and culture, is 90% of all FDI, of all these companies, come from either the US or the EU. Now, Ireland's industrial policy isn't all about foreign direct investment. As Olivia particularly mentioned, it's also about growing an indigenous export-led uh, tech sector and food sector. Food is our natural resource, and tech is the, you know, the other obvious uh, product. So in that area, and Alan mentioned this, we actually have, because of this industrial policy, a very strong income statement. If you think of Ireland as a company where it has an income statement and a balance sheet, we now in 2017 have a very strong income statement. The uh, growth is higher than China's, the GNI, which is really a measure of wealth, is as high as uh, Dublin and, uh, sorry, is as high as France and uh, the UK. And we've trade surpluses, okay? Now, I know it's not distributed across the whole country, and that's a, another issue, but this, we have a very strong income statement. Our issue is we have a very weak balance sheet. So it's a small economy. We have a national debt of 200 billion, which is 110% of our national income, which accounts for 15 cents of every euro spent by the government. 
So strong income statement, but we very tight in terms of highly leveraged balance sheet. And this becomes important when we move into what the future is for Ireland. Today, what are we facing? Our issues, we have internal issues, and this school spends a lot of time, and rightly so, talking about the various infrastructure and uh, healthcare issues. We also are facing, probably, definitely in my lifetime, and I think everybody would agree since the Second World War, a time of what uh, somebody once called, or somebody recently called, VUCA, which is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. This here is the exact same slide as I showed. What do we have? And this is in the last three years. We have the US pursuing an America first policy. We have Ireland still surrounded by the UK, really Britain in terms of geographically, we are still an island behind an island, right? Uh, basically Brexiteers pursuing a, a, a Britain first policy. And we also have within the EU, EU a trend towards a fragmentation. It's in my view, and Macron talks a lot about this, there's going to be a two speed Europe and within all that, and Mr. Juncker over with Mr. Trump last night, if anybody looked at that, it's, it's, it, we are going into a period of trade wars and we're going into a period of protectionism. If we do, then it's small countries that have the most to lose in a protectionist world. So if you look at this slide, you see that the US, their exposure in terms of their GDP to exports is 13%. For Ireland, it's 125%. So we're facing a very, complex, uh, ambiguous, a VUCA world externally. So let's look back at our industrial policy. And the questions I'd ask is, firstly, how long more can Ireland continue to offer international multinationals, what I call arbitrage opportunities, meaning favorable tax and labor advantages? Second point, and I think Olivia made mention of this, foreign direct investment, when it was welcome to Ireland, had also, and it's in the abstract of this paper, had two other supposed advantages is was to raise the standard of management in our indigenous companies and also to provide the breeding ground for uh, indigenous entrepreneurs. And I want to cover that in the next slide. And then the next thing is, the third aspect and the third question is whether our indigenous sector is actually capable of competing in this new world. So this is my view in terms of uh, foreign direct investment. The four supposed benefits, corporate tax, create well-paid jobs, improve the standard of management, and encourage an entrepreneurial ecosystem. In the first two waves, which were pharmaceuticals and IT, like Digital Equipment Corporation, each of those were delivered. As we moved into 2010 and since then, where now the latest wave have been digital tech companies like Facebook and Amazon, Yes, corporate tax take, if anything, has increased in terms of its relative benefit, as has the creation of well-paid jobs. But these companies are actually incredibly profitable. Uh, the Amazons, the uh, Netflix, the Facebooks, or whatever. And in, uh, there is, and I see it in Dublin, uh, at least, uh, inflation of wage expectations. So we're beginning to see a parallel economy between the people working in the FDI and the people working in the local economies. And that's causing huge problems, I think. And one of the contributing factors to this issue to do with uh, accommodation and the high cost of rents. The other point, in terms of improving the standard of management, this generation of companies are actually controlled out of Silicon Valley. It is very much command and control. So we're not building. It's, there isn't a spillover effect. And finally, there's very little startups coming from this activity. If you're being paid a huge amount of money, no matter how ambitious or whatever, it's very uh, difficult to actually rationalize, go out and start a new company. So my message here is that um, you know, FDI is very important, but the benefits, and we should look at that again. Ireland's indigenous tech, and this is a complex slide, I'm not going to get into it. Olivia already has given much more interesting statistics, but basically, our indigenous tech, we're halfway there when compared to the Scandinavian countries in terms of what we invest in technology, in, in research and development. We're halfway there. We're good at some areas, but basically we're 50% of the pathway. A lot better than in the Culloden era, but still a lot to do. And then Brexit. And if you go back, we see Britain is still, we're the island behind the island. One thing interesting in 2010, the Lib Dem uh, coalition government with Tories developed one of the first industrial policies 
for the UK that wasn't based on the city and on finance. Uh, this policy, which the Tories then junked for the first few years, has been taken up again by Theresa May. And if you read it, and it's a recent publication by Theresa May, it's an identical industrial policy to Ireland. You could take leaves out of what we've been doing for 30, 40 years, and you'll find it now in the UK. And one thing they've done, and again, it goes back to the point Olivia make, made, is it's a kind of a well-thought-out policy. So on tax, so if you're an entrepreneur now setting up a company, the UK tax regime is now more favourable on all counts than the Irish tax regime. This is the area I work in, okay? And we've done analysis. So if a company was sold for 100, and who gets what from the sale of a company? In the UK, the founder gets 55, the option holders, the people he employs, he or she employs to work in the company get five, the investors and what they raise, and the tax payable to the government, etc., is 18, 14. Look at Ireland, there's a big difference. And the fact is, in mobile talent, to go back to it, considerations like this need to be addressed. So that's from the point of view of Ireland, or of the entrepreneur. If you look at our world of a VC fund, Investing in startups, again, the tax regime in the UK is way more favourable than Ireland's regime on all counts in terms of um, who gets what on success. So we're facing a lot of problems. That's kind of a, I won't say a geopolitical, it's a kind of a classic um, view, microeconomy view maybe. But should we, I think we should also talk about a bigger elephant in the room, and I'm not talking about Donald Trump or anybody like that. I'm talking about probably the biggest global trend, which is this uh, trend, and it's difficult to talk about it or explain it, but artificial intelligence. So, and I've just got two slides on this, and they're important. Um, firstly, we started off in the 70s with computers. Then we ended up, we had the internet, which were basically connected computers in the 1990s. Then we had this, sensor and data collection. We have the mobile phone, that's a computer. And in the last five years alone, we now are creating machines that can sense situations, act, adapt. They basically are, have the intelligence of, say, jellyfishes or whatever, but they have first human intelligence that's external to the human brain. And that's called associative intelligence, and it's creating a whole raft of machinery that you'll see coming into the economy, in every economy, over the next decade. We're all aware of driverless cars. Just a good example, nobody in our world even knew about driverless cars uh, five years ago. Okay? And if to put this into context and why it's important, is if you think back historically in information uh, in the, in, up to the 15th century, it was internal, it was kept in monasteries, it was in manuscripts. Then we had the printing press, externalized, distributed, fantastic. The impact, what did we get? The Reformation, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment. Now, if you take what's happening now, it's the assembly of information, it's intelligence, okay? And that, up until now, has resided in the human brain, or cores of experts. Cores of experts, universities, um, journals, McGill School, experts, and that's the way we've lived, and it's a very, you know, and it has worked. That is being, in the next 10 years, believe me, there's going to be a complete change. That sort of intelligence is going to reside in what we call machines, platforms like Google, that's a platform, or crowds. It's the wisdom of the crowd. What's the implication? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. All we know is it's causing severe social disruption. And in actual fact, my own view is that is either one of the main driving force for this global instability. That around the, uh, again, that's the same slide, you have companies, and they're basically either American or Chinese. And go back to the rise of China. I think it's the, you have Google, Facebook, but then you also have Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu. So what about Ireland? Where do we go in this incredibly complex world? Very quickly, um, there's, a, uh, there's something called scenario planning that people use, very, uh, oil companies used to forecast the disruption in the 1970s. It's, very, it's quite sophisticated, but I'm not going to get into it. But basically, you look at the uncertainties, the certainties, and then figure out where to go. The 
uh, what's certain in the world? Population growth, uh, increasing longevity, uh, climate related, limits to growth, people, climate is coming center stage no matter what government says. Okay, so there's great trends here. What's uncertain? Global politics. Um, and then we have to look at what could Ireland do and how can they basically avail of the trend as being its friend, as they say. Well, I think we have to look at uh, the future of the industrial policy in Ireland. The first one is build on our strengths. And the second one is look at health. I think health and green are the two core parts of a new industrial policy. And the third is, it's already been mentioned by my two colleague speakers, is talent. So very quickly, if you look at building on our strengths, yes, continue. It is a fantastic advantage of our location and culture that we're so close to the US and the EU. Build on it. But how do we build on it? Well, here, just, I just represent what has been the historical case of where the IDA, in our case, has targeted the large uh, US corporates who come to Ireland for all sorts of good reasons, and they also come because they're very profitable for tax reasons. Well, there are five times more smaller U.S. companies who, for globalization purposes, have to, have to expand, they have to go international much earlier. Because if not, it's going to be the Chinese or it's going to be European companies that are going to compete. They're, they want to come to Europe. I can see this. So an opportunity for Ireland is to start bringing these smaller companies and offer them services. And we have a very, you know, very well-educated workforce. Offer them market strategy, market entry, and market expansion. And one reason to do it is firstly to do it, and then secondly, it addresses the biggest weakness that we have between the indigenous tech and FDI, is it basically creates a context between the smaller US SMEs and the Irish SMEs. And I've seen this happen in a few cases where there's an exchange of expertise and people. And I think that could be the greatest strength, way of strengthening the Irish uh, SMEs. So that's building our strengths. The next one, I'm not going to go into it in too detail, it's all in the paper, is make healthcare. I was at this, uh, I was here last night and it was the most depressing thing to listen to the healthcare, the discussion on healthcare system. But imagine if we took healthcare, and I mean healthcare in the broader sense and the, the style of living and living in healthily, and make it part of our industrial policy, right? Take it out of the political, domestic uh, morass that it's in, and then, and I just ask you to think, now some of this could scare the living daylights out of people, but imagine if you took the managers of our foreign direct investment factories who were top class, imagine having them run the factories of the healthcare system, which are basically our acute hospitals. Imagine li liberating our doctors and nurses to become researchers and to work worldwide and bring back these expertise. Imagine depoliticizing you know, de the whole system. People would relocate to Ireland because of our healthcare system. And I think this would be a huge advantage for Ireland if we could think of healthcare as part of our industrial policy and not part of a cost base. It's an opportunity. Two minutes, yeah. Yeah. Just there. And then the other is make the green economy. Ireland is an interesting, you know, we, we are green for the reason that we've no first industrial revolution. Make that again an advantage. Ireland is, it's small to trial, but it's big enough to prove. It, it could be a test bed for every renewable technology, every uh, green, low carbon technology could be situated in Ireland, and it could become a source of export overseas. But in doing so, it would enrich the, the quality of life for all of us. And that brings me to the third point, which we've already covered, is it's called the law of cool. Any group of people basically want to uh, socialize with people like themselves. Artists like artists, engineers like engineers. So pick the creative people, and they're engineers, architects, artists, or whatever. Make Ireland benefit from the law of cool, which is basically attract the world's talent. And a lot of that, the basics are there. We have a very strong artistic community. The FDI has created multilingual thousands of people in our cities. So there's a great opportunity. And we should invest in bringing these cohorts together. So this is my view of the future of uh, Irish industrial policy. It's a virtuous circle. It starts where we are with vibrant foreign direct investment, fertilizing and creating an indigenous tech ecosystem. That will generate and attract 
the world's talent. And the world's talent would come to Ireland because we're a leader in the green and health lifestyles. If we can achieve that, then I think we are well, we're in a super position to navigate the rapids that are coming down our way. Thank you very much.